are locked items off the table. If yes, you know, for now. Yes. Park, why, a, why is that? Well, because we're able to, if people are vaccinated and wear their mask, there's no need for lockdown. Lockdown's off the table tonight on the Donlin Report. President Biden tries to calm fears after a weekend of panicked headlines about Omicron. What we know and what we don't know straight ahead. We have questions, so do you, and we have some answers tonight from our top doc. He's here to talk everything we need to know about that new variant. No panic, again, just the facts. Plus, how did a stowaway make it from Guatemala to Miami in the landing gear of a 737? Hope you had a nice long weekend. Great to have you with us. We begin a new week here live from our Chicago studios. The Donlin Report starts right now. The Omicron variant is likely here in this country already, but according to several experts, there's no need to panic. That is the pulse of America tonight. Chances are you woke up Friday to a slew of headlines or alerts on your phone about a new COVID variant, Omicron. A day off for most of us turned into a day of concern. Everything from a travel ban from certain Southern African countries to a stock market sell-off. Well, tonight we take a deep breath. Here's what we know. A doctor in South Africa who was one of the first to detect a new strain of the virus says the symptoms of Omicron, so far anyway, are mild. Take a listen. Looking at the mildness of the symptoms that we are seeing, currently there is no reason for panicking as we don't see severely ill patients. Still, President Biden has now banned travel from eight South African countries, including several where the virus has not yet been detected. This variant is a cause for concern, not a cause for panic. We'll fight this variant with scientific and, and knowledgeable actions and speed, not chaos and confusion. So Omicron has been detected in several other countries, including Canada, Israel, some in Europe, but no travel ban there. Israel and Japan, meantime, have banned all foreign travel. The president did reassure the country today that lockdowns are off the table. You heard that off the top. For now, masking up indoors, though, may come back in full force, and it'll be several weeks, according to public health officials, before we know how effective the vaccines we have will be against Omicron. Today, the president pushed the booster and then pushed it again and again. Do not wait. Go get your booster. Go get the booster shot today. The booster strengthened that protection significantly. You have to get the, get the booster. Get your booster. A fully vaccinated booster person is the most protected against COVID. Let me reiterate once more. We also now have booster shots that provide extra protection. So that was a key message today from the president. There is perhaps a lot more, though, we don't know than we do at this point. Is it more contagious? Does it spread faster? Is it truly milder? What does it mean for the vaccines we have? For those questions and more, we start with our friend, Dr. Bob Lahida. His new book, Immunity Strong, comes out later this month. Doctor, you've always told us and several others have, follow the science, but what is the science right now? Because it seems like with Omicron, we're not really sure. Right, so Joe, we have 33,000 genes in this little virus. Of that, about 10% uh, of those genes will upregulate or downregulate, and that's what we call a mutation. This gene pool, apparently, that's responsible for Omicron has upregulated. But the question is, even though it's more transmissible, does it cause more severe disease? We simply do not know. But I do not expect that to be the case because of what Dr. Coetzee said. That's the South African health uh, director who has patients with Coetzee. And she says they were mildly ill. And that's good news because it's not like the Delta when it first came out, when everybody was getting really, really sick and dying. So we don't know enough yet because we have not genomically identified Omicron in the United States yet, but it's only a matter of time. So, so how, how do you explain the, I guess, for lack of a better word, doctor, the panic that we heard on Friday and that I guess has backed off a little bit today as people say we need to sort of, in your words, learn more about this thing? Yeah, because there were 10 mutations 
that were observed out of 50 mutations that occurred in the virus that was isolated from those people in South Africa, Israel, Belgium, UK, and now two patients in Canada. So we don't know whether they are going, it's going to cause more serious disease. We do know it's highly transmissible, apparently, which is not good news for the unvaccinated population. However, our own vaccines, based on what the data that I've seen about stereochemistry of the spike protein, which is that protein that the virus pops up with or causes to happen in your cells, in your body after infection, that spike protein is critical to whether vaccines work, monoclonal antibodies work, and all other things work. I suspect that the booster shots will be very, very helpful in protecting all Americans. When will we know for sure on that, doctor? And I guess the bigger concern on that is, is there ultimately going to be a variant of this, you think, that will outrun the vaccines we have? I don't think so, Joe. I think our vaccines, you may get sick, even if you're vaccinated, but you're, again, we say that after the booster, especially, you're not going to die. You're probably not going to be on a respirator. We simply don't know at this time. But as I said on Friday, this is not time to panic. We, you know, people get hysterical. I've got patients calling all day long saying, what should I do? What should I do? Everybody for sure is running out to get the booster right now which is good news. Right, they should. Uh, so the travel ban, doctor, let's talk about this because that I think was part of what maybe added to some of the panic or at least the concern. Where are you on this? Do they work or don't they? Well, first of all, the African countries that are affected like Lesotho, Namibia, and other areas within South Africa are somewhat offended by the fact that the world has jumped right. to conclusions that they produce. And my concern is that they'll not report further variants because they know that if they report a variant, as harmless as it may be, or as severe as it may be, they're going to be blockaded. Nobody's going to be able to fly in or out of those countries. And that's a big concern for those health ministers. And I, I feel their pain. However, at this time, I think the blockade in certain countries may be prudent since they've already been instituted. I think Dr. Uh, President Biden, uh, is his uh, fact that he doesn't want to blockade the United States right now is a good thing because we have no data to show that this is going to cause more severe disease. There will so, always be another variant, doctor. Um, is that a, is, you think so? I mean, Delta scared us, right? And then I, but, yes. I mean, at that point, we learned about it. We found out perhaps that maybe this thing wasn't as dangerous as we thought. We're not as spooked maybe with this one as we were. Right. But I guess the question again is, are we going to get to a point where maybe we are going to have to take one of these seriously? And what do we do when that happens? Well, remember the Lambda and the Mu from right. South Africa, uh, South America, rather. Uh, they were they turned out to be nobodies. And right now, this Omicron variant may turn out to be nothing. But right now, we have to be very careful. And, and the point that is made here is people who don't have or have not been vaccinated should not take a chance. I implore everyone to be very careful because we hear about the variant. If you've been vaccinated and got your booster shot, no big deal. But if you haven't been, imagine getting infected with something we know very little about and perhaps winding up in the intensive care unit and dying. Right. Well, we have to live with the fact that it's changing, doctor. And I think hopefully uh, we're better prepared, certainly now than we were a year ago, to at least try to do our best to put up a defense. Uh, Dr. Absolutely. Bob, it's always good to see you. The new book is called Immunity Strong. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Joe. All right. So those are the doctor's orders. How is America reacting to all of this? For that, let's ask our friends. Mo Kelly, host of the Mo Kelly Show in L.A. And Tony Katz, he's the host of Eat, Drink, Smoke. Uh, Mo, let's start with you, Mo. What do you make of this reaction on Friday? We just kind of gotten over Thanksgiving and we all woke up and our phones were going nuts. The market was down 900 points. We got travel restrictions. And, you know, now, though, the markets are bouncing back. What happened? Well, you have to think we've gone through an unprecedented two years in this country. We're going, coming up on 800,000 Americans who've died because of COVID, whichever variant you want to ascribe to it. So Americans, I would say writ large, are concerned. Now, from a political standpoint or a government strategy standpoint, you, ha you can choose between an abundance of caution or an abundance of COVID. We're getting ready to go into <laughs> the winter months. You want to get out in front of this as opposed to being behind and trying to catch up, where arguably we've already experienced 
experienced that before. So I think initially people may have been concerned, but now they're understanding we're better prepared. Yeah, we don't want an abundance of COVID, Tony, that's for sure. But we happened to notice the other day after these panicked headlines all came out, there were 100,000 plus at the big house watching Michigan and Ohio State. I mean, I think Americans feel like we've done almost as much as we can. Americans don't uh, panic. That, that's different than whether or not people uh, panic. So the, the point there is that when you see the markets go down as they did and today, they're up 200, 300 points near that, uh, respectively, between the Dow and, and the NASDAQ, they realize, okay, those initial reports are not things we should be responding to. People going to watch Michigan, uh, they want to see a win over Ohio State, and nothing was going to stop them from doing so. But I have to disagree with the doctor right there. I, I don't believe that what we've learned about Omicron it tells us that you should get a booster. It tells us us that we know absolutely nothing. If the doctors in South Africa are telling us that the symptoms they've seen are less than Delta, less than COVID, extremely mild, and they don't even lose taste and smell, that's not something that's going to inspire people to go out and get a booster. That President Biden used it in that press conference today to say, get a booster, get a booster, get a booster. He took advantage of an opportunity. I don't know how many Americans are really interested in following him down that road. And, and to, to Mo's point. You're right, 600,000 people have died, but we still don't have answers about comorbidities. We still don't talk about weight loss in America. Some of the other things that would very much help and keep those emergency rooms less occupied if we had people focusing on that, as opposed to your only option is vaccine and booster. Well, Mo, what do you, uh, what do you say to that? Because that is the one thing we do know that we have. Well, well, first, I would politely disagree with Mr. Cox and think that I would be in a place to disagree with the doctor. But I do remember what he said, that the mutations are, have about 10 percent of the genome. So at its base, at its foundation, it is still COVID and it's still um, it's going to be treatable by the vaccine on some level. So if anything, we're asking for some protection as opposed to no protection. And yes, better lifestyles, healthier living will help our overall outcomes, but I'm not going to to necessarily catch COVID because I go to the grocery store and the guy next to me is obese. So we have to think about this in a collective sense, not just an individual sense as far as our dietary needs. And yes, if we're living better than fewer people are in the emergency rooms, but we have to control that which we can control. And if we have a vaccine which helps in, in terms of the workflow in our emergency rooms, then yes, let's keep going down that path. Tony, are people listening anymore? I mean, those of us who've gotten the shot feel like we've done our parts. Uh, those who aren't going to get it aren't going to get it. Those who will wear masks, well, it feels like people are doing what they feel comfortable with on a personal level at this point. Uh, and that's a very, very good thing. Your, your question is the right question. Are Americans listening? And the question is listening to whom? To Dr. Fauci? No, they're done. They're finished with that. There is no faith in Dr. Fauci. He gave what can only be described as a awful performance on Face the Nation uh, on, on Sunday. They're not buying into the hype and to the fear that the market may move in fear. We can talk all day long about the difference between Wall Street and Midwest Main Street. Midwest Main Street goes to watch football. They're going to watch the Indiana Pacers. They're going to uh, concerts. They're going out to bars and restaurants. The people who want to live in fear, they want to live in fear. There's nothing wrong with being vaccinated. I am not anti-vax. I am anti-mandate on every single level. But my point was, we are not discussing enough about the things that can help people avoid long-term illness and creates those comorbidities. When we find out the comorbidities that are connected with right. COVID, that's going to be a very, very interesting, interesting number. Mo, I'm out of time. Ten seconds, if you would. As popular as Dr. Fauci might be, he's unpopular in other circles. Is it time just for a change in messaging to change him? No, it's just not about performance. It's about the facts. And at, at the end of the day, if you look at the percentage of Americans vaccinated, they obviously believe more in Dr. Fauci than they disbelieve him. All right, Mo Kelly, not host sure. of the Mo Kelly radio show in L.A. And Tony Katz, he's the host of Eat, Drink, Smoke. It's great to have you both, as always. Thanks for the time. You got it. More Enjoy. mobs pulling off smash and grab robberies over the long shopping weekend. And one former police chief saying this trend will spread nationwide. How do police prevent these from happening? And how does a stowaway make it from Guatemala to Miami in the plane's landing gear without being detected? How does he survive? And don't forget that you can follow us on social media at The Donald Report on Twitter. Back after this.
Another wave of smash and grab style robberies shook multiple stores over the weekend, including in Minneapolis Best Buy. Law enforcement leaders have warned this style of looting is hard to stop and will likely continue to spread across the country. And there's more to all of this, too. A security guard for a news crew based in San Francisco was shot and killed last week while that crew was covering a smash and grab incident at a clothing store. Joining me now, retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Sergeant, it looks like this is not only a thing now, but it's a thing that's getting worse. Clearly, and so I think legislators need to start acting right now and enacting laws that are going to severely punish these bad doers. And then we need to see that with the same frequency and regularity that we are with these smash and grabs. Folks need to know that there are going to be serious consequences if you engage in this kind of activity. And what? I suggest that not only do they throw the book at them when they arrest them, but do like they did back in the day when you would get somebody who was involved in some criminality, impound their car and hold it for a maximum of 30 days while you're pending your investigation. What are the consequences right now? Let's say the, uh, the people we're looking at in this video, Sergeant, are caught. W what are the consequences? Is this a theft charge? What is it? Well, obviously, it would be more than a misdemeanor theft just based on the dollar amount. But, you know, first they have to be apprehended. And then, of course, it depends on what their criminal history is like, whether or not they're going to get a slap on the hand if and whenever they're identified. And so uh, store owners are going to have to be proactive. They're going to have to start to inconvenience real shoppers, folks who are coming in and spending money by putting in barriers and mm. other things that might preclude a quick getaway, if you will. And I think people will understand. Yeah, what, what do you do? I mean, you're thinking about a security guard. There's no way that a security guard or even two or three can stop 30 people with crowbars. If you're running security for a store, Sergeant, what would you recommend they do? I would, I would suggest that they harden their target, that maybe they, uh, certainly during business hours, tie things down, secure them so that you can't leave the store with them. Like I said, it's going to be an inconvenience to shoppers. If you're talking off hours when they're doing these smash and grabs of uh retail businesses through the street, you know, front window, display window, don't have anything that's visible. Don't leave money and valuables in your cash register. Secure that as well so that it can't be carried out. They're going to have to think outside of the back, outside of the box. What about police departments, Sergeant? Is there any way they can think outside the box? Because as we know, they don't necessarily have the resources right now to stop this kind of activity. They're in and out quickly. More than likely, these thieves know they're probably not going to get caught. And to your point, if they are caught, there won't be serious consequences. Can police sort of carve off, I don't know, special units or something to address this problem? Do they have that kind of resource? It would depend from department to department whether or not you have the uh, personnel resources to set up something like we call a SPEW, special problem unit, uh, mm. within your agency. But listen, these are random. They're at odd hours. They're at yeah. different hours. And they're all over the place. So it's very hard to predict when 30 people <laughs> are going to show right. up and do a smash and grab. Sheesh. Okay, let's uh, talk about the other unfortunate event we wanted to get you on tonight, Sergeant. And that's the uh, security guard who was shot and killed in Oakland hired to protect a news crew. The crew was doing a story on these smash and grabs. In fact, we talked with you the last time you were on about a news crew that was confronted in Portland. And for our viewers who missed that, we'll show a clip of that right now. I'm advising you to turn that camera off right now. Turn that camera off right now. Turn that camera off 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 now. So that scene uh, didn't elevate, certainly to the level the scene did in San Francisco, where this security guard was uh, sadly shot, and ultimately he died a few days later. Um, where are we on the streets, Sergeant, when you have news crews that can't even go out and cover stories on a public street without threats like this? Again, something very difficult to predict. You never know who you're dealing with. I always say err on the side of caution. Let them uh, do what it is that they're doing. If they're giving commands to not video, you certainly don't want to draw the ire of someone. And let me just express my condolences to the family and the police department of this former retired police officer who's now probably just trying to make a few couple of coins over the holiday, working security, and then he has his life taken in such a shameful and cowardly way. Yeah, that's a great point, Sergeant. Thank you for that. Um, a bigger picture. What worries you the most? I mean, as I think about this, this was your career and is your career still to this day. When you were on the streets, um, has, has crime changed? I guess what I'm looking at now seems like it's presenting 
challenges in policing that we necessarily haven't seen, uh, at least recently, these kinds of issues and in the sheer numbers we're seeing them? Well, certainly this is something new. I mean, I certainly didn't experience any of this kind of uh, criminality when I was on the streets, but you know, there's a lack of respect for authority. Uh, there is little consequence when you do uh, engage in criminality. And, you know, folks have often not respected police officers. Uh, so you understand that they would have even less respect for someone that they deem a security guard. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to not put your life above the loss of property or damage to property. Let them tear up whatever it is that they want and hope the home, the store owners have good insurance. Retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Sergeant, it's always good to see you. Take care. You too. Two high profile legal cases getting underway today. Ghislaine Maxwell accused of creating a network of underage sex victims for the late Jeffrey Epstein. Also, Jussie Smollett charged with lying to police about being attacked by two Trump supporters. We're talking about both cases coming up. And to all our viewers out there, we want to thank you for making News Nation the fastest growing cable news network in the country. We appreciate you watching. Back with more after this. trial for Ghislaine Maxwell began today. Maxwell, the accused accomplice of Jeffrey Epstein, who committed suicide in his prison cell while awaiting his own sex trafficking trial in 2019. Maxwell facing multiple sex trafficking related charges, including sex trafficking of a minor and enticing multiple minors to travel to engage in illegal sex acts. Four alleged victims expected to testify in the trial and the shadow of Jeffrey Epstein will likely loom over this case. Maxwell has vigorously denied any wrongdoing, could face up to 70 years in prison if convicted. So the question jurors must answer, was Maxwell a victim herself or an accomplice? Joining me now for more on this, a sexual abuse attorney and survivor herself, one of the first known victims of Dr. Larry Nasser. It's good to have Sarah Klein back with us today. Sarah, what are you gonna be watching for in this trial? Yeah, so today I found really interesting. We got a sense of sort of the stance the defense is going to take and the stance that the prosecution is going to take. What I found interesting about the defense's strategy is it's very, very typical. They're going to go to unreliable memories. Their expert in that it has been on the stand over 300 times defending in what, in my opinion, are the indefensible other child predators out there. The jury in Weinstein didn't buy her testimony, and it will be interesting to see what they do here. The other thing the defense is doing, which is really interesting, Interesting, but very, very common is making Maxwell the victim, making right. her the scapegoat who is only on trial because Epstein is dead. Defense counsel even said Maxwell is filling the hole and filling the empty chair um, as Epstein is, is gone. Now the prosecution today um, came out swinging. They put on the stand a pilot who flew privately for Epstein for many, many years starting in the early 90s up until 2019. And he set the scene that Maxwell and Epstein were a couple of sorts, always together, flying mm -hmm. all over the world together. I thought he did a great job, only 30 minutes of testimony, but he'll be back on the stand tomorrow morning. I'm sure the testimony will be very graphic, Sarah, but as I understand it, at least some of, if not many of the victims who will be testifying in this case, claim in will claim in their testimony that Maxwell was in some ways worse as far as this grooming than Epstein was. Absolutely. And that's something we learned today, too. The prosecution plans to talk about grooming. And the grooming comes from someone that you deeply trust, who earns your respect, who takes care of you, the nurturer of sorts. And so we're going to learn about that concept and we're going to learn about the behaviors associated with grooming. And I think that they're right. The enablers are oftentimes much worse than the perpetrators themselves. What role do you think Epstein will play in this? I mean, it's kind of a fine line, as you said, for uh, prosecutors in this case to delineate because much of since his death is, is as you pointed out, going to come down onto to Ghislaine Maxwell. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously his his shadow looms large in this courtroom, but what people need to understand, this is not a trial about whether or not Epstein raped children. This trial is a very, very narrow in scope, and it's something I believe the judge has done very well, which is defining that this is only determining whether or not Maxwell helped Epstein recruit and abuse for underage girls. And so as long as we focus on the purpose of this trial, I do believe that the Epstein House of Horrors is, is not going anywhere. And I suspect, you know, it's going to be very interesting to, to see sort of what happens with, with enabler number one. And I don't think she's going to be the first. There might be more charges down the road as we learn more. What about the people who have reportedly been linked to Epstein? Do you think more more comes out of this trial than we knew beforehand. You know, again, this the, this trial is going to be very, very limited in scope. It depends on what evidence is presented. I heard rumors that her little black book of phone numbers is, is going to come up in this trial. I don't think that this is going to be about big names swinging around the courtroom. Again, this is about whether or not she enticed and was a co-conspirator and engaged in, in, you know, essentially trafficking these children and and, um, and coerce them into engaging in illegal sexual activity. So as long as we keep the focus on her and you know all of all of the good reporting done on this keeps the focus on her, um, I think it is going to be something where we might see a possible um, possible prison sentence. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, she could face up to 70 years, as, as I understand. And I think this trial, as I saw, could last about six weeks thereabouts. Sarah Klein, uh, thanks for your insight and input. Sexual abuse attorney and survivor herself. It's great to have you again. We'll be in touch. Thanks so much. Shifting gears now to another high-profile trial starting today. That's the trial involving former Empire star Jesse Smollett. Smollett accused of making false reports to authorities back in 2019. He told police he was beaten up by two men the victim of a racist and homophobic attack in downtown Chicago. After investigating, police said it was a hoax set up by Smollett himself. Joining me now for more on the case, our friend, former state and federal prosecutor, Pat Brady. Pat, this case was big nationwide, but it was crazy in Chicago for oh, a nuts. lot of reasons yeah. that we'll get into here. But the first question is, why are we at this point with a trial? I assume that Dan Webb, a very prominent, probably the best prosecutor in the country at one point, made an offer that he didn't want, so they're going to roll the bones and go to trial. That's the only chance he's got. By that, you mean he is sticking to his story, and he's going to go down in flames if that's what it means. I would think so. And this is a great example of you've got a, a very good judge, you've got a fantastic prosecutor, and a very narrowly focused case, kind of like the Epstein case. So, so this is going to have to, I'm assuming, unravel at some point, right? I mean, yeah, he I said know, this I, is going to happen. We have these two brothers who say Smollett paid him $3,500. They're going to testify, right? Yeah, they're, and if you took these two brothers, they're right out of central casting, the people you'd go hire to go beat somebody up. I mean, it was. Mm -hmm. but that night, I remember I was downtown that night. It was freezing. Right. It we, was one of the coldest nights in years. Well, the ridiculousness of it, and I don't mean to get too regional, but if you're wearing a MAGA hat in that part of Chicago, <laughs> you're going to get beat up. Not just <laughs> I mean, the president got like three votes right. there. So and it was cold, and they were going to Subway, and the, the, the police immediately uh, thought that this was a hoax. Yeah, I think that was, it's another interesting element to this, Pat, because nationwide, I think initially everyone wanted to believe him, but then it, in Chicago from the jump, there were people who were like, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right for a number of things. It was two in the morning, the coldest. It was, I think it was 30 below. It was, it was, it was a polar vortex. Yeah, and I walked exactly. across the loop that night into the studio. It was, it was horrible. Right. And to your point, I, I had, I mean, you get it. If you're on a subway, man, it's got to be a little <laughs> warmer than that. <laughs> I had lived in Chicago for about a year at that point, And I, I'm to your point, I had never seen a MAGA hat. So there were a lot of people in Chicago saying, wait a minute. And then yeah. police, I think pretty quickly were able to sniff this thing out and say, wait, the other thing that was weird was there was one camera that Smollett was apparently counting on capturing this, and that camera didn't work. It was too cold. <laughs> it, was, it was literally 50 below. I mean, that just added to the bizarreness of the story. Plus, they caught him on everything. They've got texts. They've got emails. It, even Charles Barkley at one point was making fun of him. He wrote a check yeah. for this. He goes, if you're going to do this, give him cash. So it was none of it made sense. And um, again, a top-line prosecutor's top-line judge. They picked a jury and or, or did closing arguments or opening statements in a matter of like eight hours. This is going to take like four or five days. 
Uh, the other thing I wanted to get you on, Pat, was, was the controversy around the state's attorney, Kim Fox, who was criticized for her handling of this case on several levels, had connections with friends of Smollett. She was criticized for how she handled it, at one point dropping several charges, which I, I guess he had to give up his $10,000 bond, right? And well, he had to do some community service. Yeah, she, Kim Fox, liberal state's attorney here in Cook County, uh, actually dismissed the charges. But she, it, it turned out that she had made contact with some of Smollett's Hollywood buddies and then through uh, Smollett's sister, told everybody she'd recused herself, which she didn't. It was legally impossible to do it the way she did under Illinois law. So, and then she just dismissed the case. Well, the chief judge, Judge Tuman, came and said, time out. We're going to appoint a special prosecutor to look at this. They did a big, long investigation, referred her to the attorney disciplinary committee, and reindicted Jesse Smollett on these six counts. That's where these six counts Yeah, and the ten, the, she, she made up, the $10,000 was just a made-up story. It, it, was, it was horrible. And then the local Democrats went after Judge Tuman for doing the right thing. Well, here was my, as I recall, and it's been a little while now, but I think I remember at the time saying, okay, if she had cut this deal and dropped these charges, which wouldn't have been unusual, right? But made him at least, requ would have required him to say, yeah, I made it up and, and this is what really happened, right? But that wasn't part of the plea deal. No. And everyone said, why not? Why, well, why wasn't it? And recusal means I'm not involved in this case because I have a conflict of interest. She told everybody in Chicago that she wasn't involved in it. Turns out she was totally involved in it. And like you said, they just threw it out. No guilty plea. We're going to dismiss it. I was down there for several years. You don't just dismiss felonies, especially high-profile ones like this. This guy tried to incite a race riot, basically, in a very city that has a lot of racial tension. So, I mean, this was a heater case. The other thing about this is you think uh, he, he might actually get jail time for this? Because somebody said no matter how this turns out, if he's found guilty, he'll probably just get probation because it's his first offense. You think that might not be the case if he's found guilty? I, I Listen, Judge Brady... <laughs> I'd send him to jail. I mean, the, the, the havoc that he wreaked on this city with what he was doing for completely selfish motives. I mean, it's, it's probationable. He could get probation, but could also go to jail for up to four years. But I wouldn't be surprised if this trial goes in smoothly, there's not a, a lot of rough evidence going, and that he doesn't go to jail for some time. All right, so the other thing is there's more to come on this, too, because the city of Chicago has sued him as well to repay the cost of all of this in the investigation, which I think was around $150,000, $200,000. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. But they, I think they stayed that pending this criminal trial, but yeah, but that's still out there. But th th I don't think people understand, unless you really live here, like you and I do, that the potential this had to blow this place up quickly to, 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 to incite a, a race riot in you know, the River North area of, of the city of Chicago. That's really bad behavior. Yeah, and I guess, again, to my point earlier, had he early on said, look, I made a mistake. I know you got, you know, kind of when you get caught, you're yeah. like, okay, you, you got me. Well, he'd done it two weeks before on the set of Empire. He sent a letter trying to do something like this with ground up Asper and got caught for it. So he's got a hit, a history. I don't know what his motivation was. Maybe his career's failing, but it's not like this is his first bite at the app. Right. All right. Well, we will see where it goes. Again, to your point, uh, four to five days on the trial, and we'll see. Uh, come back and we'll follow it because I know a lot of folks in the country are. Yes, exactly. All right. Pat Brady, good to see you. As always, thanks yep, for the thank time. You. How does a stowaway make it from Guatemala to Miami in the plane's landing gear without being detected? And how does he survive? We'll have more on that coming up. Another migrant caravan making its way to the U.S. from southern Mexico. The latest on that group and what the Biden administration is doing to curb the crisis at the border. We're back with more after this. What a story out of Miami, a stowaway found in the landing gear of a 737 after flying all the way from Guatemala. Joining me now for more on this, News Nation Zone, Brian Enton. Brian, it's great to see you. I have a whole lot of questions about this. I'll start with two. How do you do this without being detected, and how do you survive? Well, good questions, Joe, and we're still trying to figure out, and so are the authorities. I mean, it's unbelievable what this guy was able to do, and the video is insane. Basically, the latest that we've learned uh, is that he got on this Boeing 737, American Airlines, in Guatemala City, uh, up in the area where the landing gear goes. Uh, he was all bundled up, uh, and he was up there for the two-and-a-half to three-hour flight when that 737 was up at 30,000 feet. We're told it's not pressurized in that area. The temperature 
temperatures can go as low as 40 uh, to 50 degrees below zero. Uh, so the plane lands in Miami on Saturday about 10 in the morning. The, the landing gear door is open. Uh, the plane taxis to, uh, to the gate. Uh, and then he pops out. Uh, and the ramp workers see him and start talking to him immediately in Spanish. They realize he's, he's OK. They call an ambulance over to check him out. Uh, and, and then he was taken away uh, by ICE. So, Brian, based on this video we're looking at here, it appears there is some room in there because I was thinking that there's just enough room for the wheel in that wheel well, and it would be hard to not get, I guess, smashed just by the wheel itself. It looks like there is some room in there, though, to get around. Yeah, there is. The area between the two wheels, where the wheels go up, there's an area in the middle, and that's where we're told right. this man was sitting. And he was clearly prepared uh, somewhat because he had uh, a number of jackets on, knowing that it would be cold. Uh, a, a lot of times when people have attempted this, they have not survived, but there have been other cases. There was even another man uh, who did the same thing from Cuba to Miami a few years ago, uh, and he also survived. I guess the other question is, and you touched on it there, but it, it isn't pressurized. So how do you breathe at 30,000 feet for three hours? Yeah, it's not pressurized. He didn't have any sort of oxygen tank or anything. Uh, I was talking to uh, one of the EMS workers today, and he was saying perhaps the guy actually passed out uh, hmm. during the flight. That's possible. And then came to again uh, when the flight landed. But they're all trying to figure out uh, how he managed not only survive, but he was able to talk and stand up and everything after the plane landed. Well, so what happens to him now? Well, uh, he was checked out by an ambulance right there, uh, re received a little bit of medical care there at the airport, but, but was okay for the most part. Uh, so, so ICE picked him up, Customs and, and Border Patrol, uh, and they've taken him to their facility uh, in uh, Broward County right now. We're told that he will go before a judge, uh, but, but the chances are that he will be deported back to uh, Guatemala. After all that, uh, sent back after what he's gone through. Uh, probably, I'm sure, uh, a little bit of a different mode of transportation in a, in a pressurized cockpit will help. What a story. Uh, the stowaway, just one of the latest examples. Brian, thank you very much of the, uh, the desperation facing Thanks, thousands of migrants making their way across the southern border. And amid the crisis that we've been following here, the Biden administration now preparing to reinstate what we know as the remain in Mexico policy. For more on this now, I want to bring in News Nation's Marky Martin. So what's the latest on, on remain in Mexico? When and will it for sure be reinstated, Mark? Hey, good evening, Joe. So it could be reinstated at any point, any day now, really. But I do want to mention right off the top, you know, this is not President Biden's first choice. This is a White House that has tried to end this program a couple of different times. However, a federal court did come forward and mandate that this program be reinstated. So if and when it is, it will force those migrants to once again go back to Mexico to wait out their asylum court proceedings for possibly months. And that is, Joe, if Mexico says yes, and that's not something that they have agreed to, uh, just yet at this time. The Mexican government really laying out three different conditions, right, that they want the United States to adhere to in order to agree to this. One, that each of these individual asylum cases be wrapped up uh, and completed within six months to expedite the process. Two, that the United States really start accelerating some of those development programs in Mexico. Emergency shelters, how do we house all these people that will go there? How do we get to the root causes of migration? And three, you know, to um, give each of those migrants that are forced to wait there medical care. So the difference here, the Biden administration, Joe, is offering every migrant that's sent back to wait, uh, at least offering them a COVID-19 vaccine. But at this point, it doesn't look like that's a requirement. Joe. Marky, as we head into December, we know that we have a clearer picture of what was an historic summer as far as encounters at the border. Yep. We saw this surge and we know now that there are more in the form of of caravans coming up still. Yeah, Joe, the, the latest numbers from the government say that more than 1.6 million migrants came through the southern border without authorization in 2021. You, you loop in the northern border, that number goes to almost 2 million. And that caravan that you're talking about, Joe, this started on Friday. You're seeing video of it right here on your screen. Started at the Guatemala border, about 1,000 migrants. You have men, women, lots of small children in this group uh, on their way north to the United States. 
And many of those migrants telling organizers on the ground, you know, we're moving because we never received those humanitarian visas that we were promised by Mexico. So we have to move. We have to provide for our families. And a lot of those organizers telling reporters in the area they do expect that caravan to reach about 1,500 people hmm. by sometime tomorrow. Yeah, because I know some of the others have sort of, they've been dropping off. We'll continue to follow it. Marky Martin, hmm. thank you for the live update tonight. On Balance with Leland Vitter it starts at the top of the hour, and he joins us now. What do you have? Now, deja vu all over again, uh, the Iran nuclear deal talks heating up. So right now, Iran is saying they won't stop enriching uranium. They're not going to stop their work on a bomb until the U.S. lifts all of the Trump-era sanctions. And those include the sanctions for all of Iran's bad acts, trying to kill U.S. soldiers in Iraq, on and on and on. Israel now is getting a little bit more nervous. They're starting to talk once again about a preemptive attack on Iran's nuclear facilities. So this was always sort of like, which, who, who goes first in this thing, right? Who has the levers? Does the U.S. get rid of the sanctions, or does Iran stop making, you know, it started yeah. stop its work on nuclear weapons? Well, the, the issue, though, at the time always is, is that Iran is continuing to enrich uranium. Iran's continuing to build new technology and do more research, all while negotiating about how then when they're going to stop. Right. I mean, there was never a belief that this was going to keep them from developing the bomb, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, there, there was a lot of talking points that it would, right, but not but necessarily a sincere belief, I guess. Or maybe delay at the least. All right, it's on balance, and it starts at the top of the hour. Thanks, Leland. We'll see you in a bit. Yeah. Outspoken pro basketball player Ennis Cantor, who not afraid certainly to speak his mind, making his freedom of speech official now. That's our American Snapshot next. First, though, the golf world remembers Lee Elder today. Elder, the first African-American golfer to play in the Masters Tournament at Augusta National Golf Club in Georgia. That was 1975. Before Elder, the only black men allowed on the course there at Augusta were caddies. Elder's first Masters was at the age of 40, well past his prime, but he paved the way for players like Tiger Woods. He was an Army veteran as well. Lee Elder won four tournaments in his career, played in all four majors. Lee Elder was 87 years old. Okay, everyone, our mission is to provide complete balanced nutrition for strength and energy. Insure with 27 vitamins and minerals. Now introducing Insure Complete with 30 grams of protein. What's my safe flight story? My truck is my livelihood. So when my windshield cracked, the experts at Safe Flight Auto Glass came. Boy, here's a kid who was so thankful at Thanksgiving, he kind of lost it. Watch. <laughs> Sometimes I just need to think deep down in my heart <laughs> that, you know, I'm great, that I can be grateful for everything I have. And sometimes <laughs> it's just, it's too good. It really is. <laughs> It's okay. Oh, that's just great. I'm glad the brother was there to give him a, a hug because he needed it. Uh, sometimes it is great, and it's certainly great to stop and recognize that every now and then. Real or fake, who knows, but it went viral. Stunning development in the search for a missing runaway teenager. Haley Shell featured last week in our Missing series on News Nation Prime. 15-year-old from Arkansas left a note in a room October 1st and hadn't been seen or heard from since. Then a News Nation viewer cracked this wide open. Yes, apparently he had met her before the News Nation came out. And then he saw the News Nation, and that was when he started asking more questions. So he could call me with as much information as he could get. Haley was in Chicago living with a man her mother believes was grooming her. Mom brought her home safely over the weekend. Marnie Hughes will be speaking with Haley's mother live tonight on News Nation Prime. Tonight's American Snapshot Now, outspoken NBA player Ennis Cantor celebrating his U.S. citizenship with a name change. He will now go by the name Ennis Cantor Freedom. We're here, there is freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom of press, which I didn't have any of those uh, with uh, Turkey. Um, you know, that's why I wanted to, and freedom also is the greatest thing that a human. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.